uh, is uh, a follow-up of that where we have invited uh, the uh, cost community participants, in particular those uh, participants that are involved in actions. Uh, we had in, uh, if I remember well, in uh, the uh, Cost Connect event, uh, around 40 cost actions represented. Uh, as well as uh, Deputy Director General of the European Commission, DG Research. Um, this webinar uh, is, of course, making an attempt to move forward, also building on a report uh, on the mission cancer uh, report that was delivered in September 2020. Uh, and uh, we are here uh, not only with the academics, uh, but also with policymakers and patient representatives uh, to reflect on how to implement this ambitious plan. So this webinar uh, hopefully will provide us with ample input uh, to the process. And uh, also, I should not forget that uh, this is with a view to the uh, upcoming World Cancer Day that will be celebrated on the 4th of February, and that aims at contributing to the global effort uh, of fighting this, uh, this horrible disease. So having said that, uh, again, I would like to uh, wish you a warm welcome. Uh, I hope that we will have uh, a rich, let's say, exchange of views and contributions. Uh, I'm very confident uh, that that will be achieved uh, because we are in uh, the good hands uh, of Tony uh, Andre, who will uh, moderate uh, the discussion. Uh, he will guide us uh, through this program. Uh, from uh, the side of cost, I would like to thank you again for connecting and reaching out. And I wish you a very, very fruitful webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, thank you, uh, Cost, for organizing this, uh, this fascinating webinar. Thank you to all the participants. And thank you to the speakers that are going to be with us during the next uh, hour and a half. Well, as Ronald said, this is going to be a, a great opportunity for having a, a very fascinating discussion about how the uh, cancer mission is going to shape and challenges and the opportunities in its development. So to do that, we have today, uh, we have the privilege of having a, a group of uh, um, key opinion leaders that are going to have some presentations at the beginning. Then in the second part of the, of the webinar, um, scientists representing very important uh, cost actions that uh, have been developing the last few years in the cancer domain will discuss together with the speakers uh, and, and will answer the Q&A from the, from the audience. So thank you so much. So the first uh, contribution is gonna come from Tina Bregant so uh, Tina is uh, um, MD-PhD. She's a senior specialist consultant of pediatrics and a specialist uh, of physical and rehabilitation medicine. And uh, she's been working in, uh, in uh, Slovenia for during her career. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemics, uh, she was included in the governmental group fighting for COVID-19 and then promoted to the State Secretary of the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Slovenia. And currently, uh, Tina is uh, the, conducting the function of Chief of the Cabinet of the Minister of Health. So I'm pretty sure, I'm absolutely sure that her policy perspective is going to be very interesting. So Tina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and privilege for me to address this high-level gathering. And I wish to congratulate the organizers of the webinar on this so important topic. Namely, every year, 3.1 million people in the EU are diagnosed with cancer and 1.3 million people lose their battle with cancer. So with current trends, it is very likely that 40% of us will have cancer at some point in our lives. In many parts of Europe, Slovenia included, cancer has become the leading cause of death. In our country, this is the leading cause for men and the second one for women. Cancer data and worrying predictions led Slovenia to choose cancer as the main health topic during the first Slovenian presidency of the Council of the EU in 2008. Uh, many joint EU programs have been developed as a result of the Slovenian presidency. 
So for example, the framework for two recommendations for the member states, uh, probably, you know, uh, one of them was to adopt national cancer control plans by uh, 2013. And the second, which was that the European Partnership for Action Against Cancer, EPAC should be established. And this was realized in September, 2009. Um, then in 2011, 14 and 18, Slovenia was entrusted with the role of the leader of this joint measure. While the Slovenian National Institute of Public Health is currently coordinating the innovative partnership for action against cancer, the so-called EPAC. Now, Slovenia really has a relatively long tradition when it comes to system-wide approaches to cancer control. And the first comprehensive National Cancer Control Program was adopted in 2010. And we dedicated a lot of attention to primary prevention, since we know that at least 40% of cancer are preventable. And this is actually the most efficient and the mostly cost efficient strategy. So in Slovenia, we have, for example, three preventative screening programs for breast, colon, and cervical cancer, which are successfully implemented on the national level. We know that more and more evidence exists that prevention plays an important role also in the prenatal period. So we really should start with prevention very early on. It's of the utmost importance that future mother and father, the parents are supported and protected as vital and prosperous members of society, especially because the lifestyles of the parents is usually inherited and so are the predispositions to certain behaviors which could later on lead also into cancer development. So already, I mentioned that all those free screening programs in Slovenia at the population level were successfully introduced and they are implemented. And we also see uh, the gradual and persistent declines in incidence and mortality rates in those cancers, as well as improvements in the five year survival rate for these cancers. So we are quite proud on this implementation of program. And then the second thing which I would like to point out is the reliable cancer data. And having complete and reliable data, this is crucial for monitoring long-term improvements and also for planning future actions. We have in Slovenia population-based cancer registry, which was founded already in 1950. So they have celebrated their 70th birthday this year. And this is one of the oldest cancer registries in Europe as well as in the world. If anyone here remembers the computer cards with holes, maybe, maybe you remember them quite ancient in the 1970s. This was the first IT control in cancer registry in Slovenia. So, uh, we believe that these registries should be developed hand in hand with the population-based registries in order to enable identification and elimination of shortcomings in the healthcare system, including the detection of socioeconomic inequalities. And so we are developing also the clinical registries, which include also the quality control of diagnostics and therapeutics as well. We, we think that uh, EU cooperation, including cross-border cooperation, is also very important. So I would like to mention the European reference networks as one of the extremely important international activities, also in the field of rare diseases. As a pediatrician, I also deal with patients who have rare diseases. So this is one very important topic to be addressed. And rare cancers, including children cancers, they are an excellent example of the added value of EU collaboration to improve the quality of treatment and also to improve access to new advanced therapies to all EU citizens. And this also diminishes inequalities across EU. Another important area for future research and action, I think, is the monitoring of childhood cancers and the consequences of treatment of their lives. 
European cooperation in pediatric oncology is an impressive demonstration of what we can achieve for children with cancer by sharing data and knowledge. And I think it's very important to stress that the data should be traveling, not the patients. In this respect, EU DigiSpace Digi would be helpful as well. Knowledge, data, and scientific evidence continuous development in research, as well as in the development of medicines, they are extremely important. Therefore, in Slovenia, we welcome that fighting cancer as one of the five key missions of the new framework research and innovation program Horizon Europe from 21 till 27. One of the targets of this mission is to save more than 3 million lives by 2030, and enable more people to live longer and better lives through better prevention, considering all types and stages of cancer. Quality of life matters as well. The possibilities for an early diagnosis that would increase the chances for survival vary considerably in Europe and even within countries. Therefore, the priority is to eliminate disparities in access to knowledge, and the knowledge is the building stone for everything, prevention, diagnostics, treatment, and care with regard to cancer. An important politically binding document for a joint fight against cancer is the Declaration on Effective Cancer Research, Europe Unite Against Cancer, signed by the ministers responsible for research of the TRIO presidency, Germany, Portugal, and Slovenia in October 2020. New technologies, they can greatly contribute to improving treatments. Since 2017, the Institute of Oncology in Ljubljana has been developing the idea of therapy with protons, proton center in Slovenia. The need to establish such a center here in Slovenia, this could have a regional dimension too. And this arises from the needs of Slovenian patients, as well as patients in the Western Balkans. This region, or let's say the whole Eastern Europe, we don't have the access to the same therapeutics and the same treatment as the Western part of the Europe. So for us, we think that to build such centers also in the countries like Slovenia, this would reduce the disparity in access to this type of treatment. We know that oncological radiotherapy poses a great problem from the countries from the east of the Europe. One of the key factors in improving the fight against cancer is also data support. So we need good data, quality of data, data standardization to allow data exchange and co-use as well as large databases to facilitate progress in relation to the knowledge required for improving the prevention and treatment and also developing personalized and innovative treatments. Also by using advanced technology, such as for example, artificial intelligence. We believe that this is the future of advanced medicine, which addresses the need of patients today and the needs of the patients of tomorrow. Early cancer detection and diagnosis are crucial. The aim is to ensure that everybody has access to screening programs and vaccination. I think that with COVID-19, we have all learned that RNA vaccination technology, which we use now for COVID, this was actually based on cancer research. So cancer research is indeed very important. Breast cancer screening is carried out in 25 member states. However, only 20 member states carry out colorectal cancer screening. So there, there is much more to be done on such simple procedure as screening is. In building the European Health Union, which Slovenia has advocated years before the occurrence of COVID-19, the European Union will have to talk even more about how to improve health systems in all member states. Uh, the virus doesn't know the borders and I think we are all in the same boat. So we have to paddle all together in this boat. There are also disparities in treatment and care. 
and we have to achieve greater collaboration among cancer treatment centers, cooperation in the exchange of patients or their data and technologies, and also offer equal access to medicines in order to ensure equal treatment for all, including regarding the most advanced technologies and medicines. We have to increase the psychosocial care of patients and their families or relatives and provide palliative care to all patients who need it. We also need to empower the rehabilitation services, not only at the tertiary level, but also on the primary and secondary level as well. Last but not least, it is essential to improve the quality of life of cancer patients and survivors since this is the main mission of modern medicine. In this, we should really follow the principle of adding life to death, not only days to life. So Slovenia, as part of the TRIA presidency, supported the commission's activities in preparing a new European beating cancer plan and a research mission for cancer. I strongly believe that the new European Beating Cancer Plan will be a step forward in reducing the cancer burden in the EU. When COVID-19 is going to vanish, the cancer problems will stay. So we need to stay and fight the cancer as well. And all this would result in better cancer prevention and care for all EU citizens. Slovenia will hold the EU Council Presidency in the second half of this year and will actively support the implementation of the European Beating Cancer Plan, especially by strengthening collaboration across the healthcare systems of member states to implement smart innovation and good practices, brought about also by the current Joint Action EPA. Although we are all under the enormous pressure of the current COVID-19 pandemic, tanking the third wave again, I'm sure we are all tired of this. However, we should and we must innovate and adapt our healthcare systems to be more robust and better responding, not only to COVID-19 pandemics, health crisis, but also to other pandemics of uh, non-infectious diseases, especially of cancer. To conclude, although COVID-19 is currently our first health priority, also here in Slovenia, you know that we are not doing so well as we are trying to. So we are, we are struggling, that's the fact. Cancer still reminds one of the key health issues which should not be put on hold. And I'm sure that where it is will, there is also a way. I sincerely hope that the implementation of the European Beating Cancer Plan to the European Health Union will be a success story if we make it a success story. So uh, thank you for your attention and I'm also willing to take some questions if there are any, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bregan, thank you, Tina. Uh, we, we, you certainly settled the stage and thank you so much for this inspiring and positive um, policy analysis of the challenge related to the development of the cancer mission. I suggest that uh, we keep the questions for the end, but for the audience, please remember that you can put your questions to the speakers and also to the members of the panel in the chat function uh, at the bottom part of, the, of your screen. So the next speaker is going to be uh, uh, Ms. Maria de Gracia Carvalho. Uh, Ms. Carvalho is a distinguished member of the European Parliament serving the I3 committee. She was the Parliament Rapporteur for uh, Horizon 2020 and she was later advisor to, the pres to President Barroso. Uh, she also served as an advisor to Commissioner Carlos Moedas. Uh, she later moved as a staff member to the Commission's Directorate General for Research and Innovation. Unfortunately, due to a previous commitment, Ms. Carvalho cannot be live with us, but she was kind enough to record uh, her presentation. So uh, the floor is hers. Good afternoon. Research and innovation are crucial to build productive, healthy and resilient societies. 
we must constantly encourage this cycle that brings research into the society and helps better our lives and increase the number of solutions that we can implement. In order to do that, we need more investments in R&D. We cannot research, reach our objectives or no hope for a better future if we don't do that. The COVID-19 crisis highlight how we cannot rest in our efforts. The strong commitments made by the European Commission and supported by the European Parliament and the European Council uh, are the reasons why we already have European vaccines that were uh, developed and produced in Europe. Uh, this is a fact. Uh, that uh, is acknowledged by not just the policy makers and the stakeholders. Actually, 70% of uh, Europeans want the European Union to do more for health. This is according to a recent survey of the Eurobarometer. Uh, spending in health research means investing in people. Uh, the correlation between health and economy was never as obvious as it is today. In addition, the, the same happened uh, in, in our understanding of the importance of having some sort of cooperation in health activities across member states. Uh, one that would manage long-term objectives that would become instrumental to ensure complementarity, uh, cooperation, uh, and also complementarity among all the EU instruments, from the pharmaceutical strategy to the EU agencies, to the partnerships and other programs and funding instruments uh, of the European Union. Uh, for example, the Agency on the Biomedical Research that was announced by President von der Leyen goes in fact in this direction and I'm very happy with this initiative. It is my sincere hope that uh, its mandate that is being designed during this year is ambitious and will uh, include cooperation on biomedical research all across Europe. Cancer, despite all the efforts and advancements that have been made in understanding the, uh, the ability um, to, to deal with this disease remains one of the greatest challenge of today. It is the second more common cause of death in Europe and in the world. Almost 40% of Europeans will face it at some stage in their lives. And with more coordination, with more cooperative efforts, with more data, we will build a better scenario for the future. Horizon Europe is the most concrete uh, tool that we have to increase our chances to beat this disease. Cancer research and innovation activities can be financed through the 8.2 billion euro attribute to the health cluster. The mission on cancer has a very ambitious target, uh, saving more than 3 million lives by 2030. Furthermore, it comes to a very comprehensive set of areas of intervention from prevention, diagnosis and treatment, quality of life, adequate access to all these dimensions and understanding, fully understanding all these dimensions. Along with the soon to be launched uh, uh, European partnerships, we have, we have several partnerships on the area of health. This cancer mission can play an important role by steering cooperation among actors, enabling synergies between the different initiatives and instruments and improve access to research data. Organizations such as COST, designed to connect research activities across Europe and to bring together our brightest minds, will also have a very significant part to play in the quest of a more cooperative ecosystem and in actually in the mission, the cancer mission. Information will need to, need to be part of it. Today we have a huge amount of data that can be processed using artificial intelligence and machine intelligence and machine learning. The use of combined technologies 
for example, has led to the vaccines treatment for COVID-19 in record times, with a secure, full, accessible European space for health research data. This same strategy can benefit uh, a lot of other areas in the, in the area of health, from diagnostics to personalized treatments. We policymakers also need to reflect on all of these, on the long-term research and innovation ecosystem that supports interdisciplinary networks, um, data, health data infrastructures, to how better design the medical education and regulatory flexibility. We need to work on skills, competence, to create health professionals that are capable to capable we deal with all these new technologies, data, artificial intelligence, all the technologies that they have available. We need to narrow the distance between research results and the solution for the patients without compromise safety and efficiency. As I heard the CEO of BioNTech saying very uh, recently, we need to build a green lane from research to deliver affordable, efficient solutions for the patients in all the areas, included cancer. So I wish you a lot of success in your works, in your debate, and I really regret that we cannot be all together physically discussing all these topics. Good afternoon. Well, thank you. Thank you to, to Maria de Graça. Very encouraging to, to, to see how the European Parliament is supporting the development of the, of the cancer mission and, and uh, seeing that uh, this concept of uh, uh, narrowing the gap between research and solution is at the front line of the European policies. So the next, um, the next speaker, uh, uh, it's uh, probably one of the most uh, significant key opinion leaders in the, in, in the field. Uh, we have the privilege of having with us Professor Walter Ricciardi, Professor Ricciardi uh, is, uh, I would say, an, an unusual combination of a privileged scientific mind and an extremely privileged perspective from the policy reality of how to manage science at national and international level. Professor Ricciardi is professor of hygiene and public health at the Universita Cattolica del Sacro Cuore di Roma. He is, as you, most of you know, he's the chair of the EU Mission Board on Cancer and also the president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. He's been also the president of the Italian National Institute of Health, the ISS, Instituto Superiore de Sanita, and has been working at the international level uh, in the most prestigious organization with very active collaborations with the World Health Organization and the European Commission. So thank you for being with us, Professor Ricciardi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and very happy to update you about what's going on with these uh, two ambitious uh, plans that are running in parallel without overlapping and creating a common narrative for conquering cancer as a mission possible for, uh, for the European Union. I'm talking, of course, about the mission and about the European Beating Cancer Plan. Uh, as you know, we have handed over our report together with the other four missions in September and uh, the, the Commission has very well evaluated the five reports and has decided uh, to go forward and has asked the mission boards to stay up to next July in order to help the Commission to uh, prepare an implementation plan and to advise on this plan that is going to be prepared by the Commission, uh, notably with respect to the research innovation needs and other measures comprising an appropriate portfolio to achieve the mission's objectives, financing and investment strategy, indicators for assessing the mission performance and feasibility of the deployment of the mission. Uh, maybe uh, I think it, you know, but maybe it's good to remind that uh, with the mission board, uh, with the, the assembly members, uh, uh, 15 plus 20 people, we have uh, worked in a different multidisciplinary and multi-institutional framework uh, 
Uh, and we have produced uh, a recommendation that is based on five intervention areas. The first, of course, uh, giving the mission uh, a perspective inside the Horizon Europe Research and Innovation Project is understanding, which is a cross-cutting horizontal area that is going to fund major programs for research under the, the label and uh, the, the label and the definition of, of ancan.eu, who is going to be hopefully the largest uh, fu ever funded project in this field in the world. And uh, understanding uh, means understanding in the three pillars of our action, which is prevention, uh, which is diagnosis and treatment and quality of life. And as uh, uh, the previous speakers uh, already said, uh, with a strong constant attention to the equity, to the equitable access uh, to all of this area, to, to research, preventions, diagnosis and treatments and, and, and quality of life. And we produced a proposal for 13 uh, bold uh, uh, actions. Uh, I, I'm not going to, to repeat them, you can find quite easily. But now I'm going to focus on the work that we are, are going to do together with the Commission from January uh, to the next uh, six months. Uh, we have to develop a, a missions implementation plan. We have to develop a communication strategy for the missions, including its launch to be prepared by the Commission. We have to prepare the future citizen engagement strategy for the implementation of the missions. We have to contribute to participate in a certain number of outreach activities with stakeholders and member states in agreement with the Commission according to what is required during the missions preparatory phase. And we have to develop the Horizon Europe missions work program uh, with uh, milestones and deliverable. Uh, hopefully this is going to be delivered within the month of May and uh, according to the level of development, uh, uh, the missions will start in June, uh, uh, July. Uh, the implementation uh, plan guiding principle are in the framework of the concept of mission. So be bold, inspirational with wide societal relevance, have a clear directions, but targeted measurables and time bound, be ambitious, but realistic uh, research and innovation actions, be cross-disciplinary, cross-sectoral and cross-actor innovation and drive multiple bottom-up solution, which is this based on the mission-oriented innovation policies, challenges and opportunities uh, uh, coming from the um, LAMI report and from the Mazzucato uh, report. Uh, the vision is the uh, ideal scenario at the formal uh, end of the mission, which is in 2027, with specific objectives that are steps to be taken through the mission to achieve a division concrete actions and concrete timeline. You know that on February the 3rd, the DG Sante and Commissioner Kiriakidis is going to present the European Bidding Council Plan. I can tell you that we have worked constantly in collaboration with our colleagues at DG Sante. And uh, we are going now to shape our implementation plans in these two areas, uh, uh, focusing of course on research and innovation in the framework of the missions, and focusing on the policies and actions in the framework of, of the European uh, Bidding Council Plan. And of course, these two plans has to uh, outline the actors and the resources who could implement the actions and of course, provide funding. Very happy to say that even though the COVID crisis and uh, the, the substantial uh, uh, disruption that uh, this uh, pandemic has uh, uh, produced, uh, the budget has been substantially intact. So the spirit and the enthusiasm of all stakeholders involved, of course, the scientific community, but the professional community, of course, the policymakers at European Commission level, at member states. And I have just uh, uh, talked with uh, uh, many members of parliament. Uh, uh, the members of European parliament are giving full support to the implementation of this. So I hope that uh, we will work together and I'm very proud that uh, this can happen and in my opinion can at the moment happen only in Europe because in Europe we share the common vision of having an equal universal access to care in all the phases of care from prevention to diagnosis and treatment to quality of life. We share common values, we share the vision, we share the mission and we share a substantial amount of funding allocated you know that in the past, there have been several attempts, particularly in the United States, to do that. They failed. I think that this is a time in which we cannot allow to fail because, as you know, 
Currently, Europe, with less than 10% of the population, is already experiencing 25% of the cancer burden of disease worldwide. And if we don't act now, this burden of disease will become unsustainable from any point of view. So we have to act now, but I'm confident that with collaboration of all the actors involved with, we can conquer this and this is mission possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ricciardi. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that the audience have plenty of questions. Please remember that you can put the questions for the speakers in the chat function. And I suggest that uh, we move to the second part so the speakers and the members of the panel uh, can have an, an open discussion and also um, answering the questions from, from the audience. So now we are going to move to this uh, second part of the, of the meeting today, in which we are going to have uh, uh, representatives from the stakeholders that are relevant in the cancer field. And also interestingly, some leaders, some, some key cost actions that had this very important role in the development of some of the activities of the cancer, of the cancer mission. We have with us for this second part, Mattia Pro, uh, president of the European Cancer Organization. We also have uh, Chrissy Brirley from the joint program in initiatives, a healthy diet for a healthy life. And three representatives from Cost Actions, uh, Hersti Flatmark um, from Oslo University, uh, who's the leader of the Cost Action dealing with a rare cancer. Also, Daniel Ortega uh, from India Nanociencia, the leader of the Cost Action on Magnetic Hyperthermia for Cancer Therapy. Daniel is not going to be with us, but he also recorded the presentation, and the Cost Action is going to be represented by Guyen Titan. And also, Chiara Riganti, uh, hello, Chiara, who comes from the University of Torino, and she's the leader of the Cost Action Multidrug Resistant Tumors. So thank you very much for being with us in this, uh, in this second part. So uh, our colleagues from the Cost Association, they uh, prepare a set of questions to, the, to these members of the, of the panel, that, uh, questions that were previously recorded. So this first question uh, had the aim of uh, giving us a short introduction of the organization or the cost action that they represent. So I think there is a video prepared that we can see. The Joint Programming Initiative, A Healthy Diet for a Healthy Life, or JPI HDHL in short, is um, an international collaboration in which 23 countries work together. And the focus of the JPI is on the intersection of the research areas of food, nutrition, physical activity and health. And in that way, we want to address the global challenge or the global societal challenge of diet related disease, uh, which, as we know, are still increasing at huge societal and personal cost. So our aim is to maximize the impact of the resources that everyone has available, which are limited. And in the JPI, the participating countries exchange information, they align research programming, but we also fund new research to answer key questions. And this is usually on topics that benefit from a transnational approach. Uh, we believe that the role of the JPI is really important because unhealthy diets and lack of physical activity and the resulting diseases out of that uh, are a huge burden on many countries, but we see that the research um, and policy on nutrition and on the relationship between nutrition and physical activity, it tends to fall um, into the gap between food and health departments. So therefore it kind of ends up being nobody's responsibility, um, which is a problem. And um, until now, we haven't done much work on cancer specifically yet. But of course, a lot of the work that we do is also relevant for the prevention of cancer. So, for example, on policy uh, evaluation and consumer behavior. Basically, the scientific background of our Coast Action Radio Mark um, it consisted on the application of uh, something called magnetic hyperthermia, which is the treating tumors through uh, localized heat that is being produced by, by some special uh, tiny nanoparticles. So they produce heat when exposed to magnetic fields. So we take advantage of this phenomenon. Uh, and to combine this localized heat with the action of other first line um, cancer treatments like chemo or radiotherapy. In our coast action, what we, we also aimed at re reverting the geographical spread of research groups in, in the area by providing the means to connect the expertise and the physical resources 
uh, across the uh, all the participants uh, in the action. Also raising the awareness amongst the researchers about misinterpreted or badly implemented experimental procedures, for example, also creating and sustaining an effective flow of the knowledge from basic science towards clinical translation, implying also the private sector where, whenever possible. And, and also to reaching out mainly to the general public through accessible publications, for example, or public speaking engagements. The main aim of the European Cancer Organization, which comprises of uh, 34 professional organizations and 20 patient advocacy groups, is to amplify the voice of all the organizations and of all the patient groups in all areas related to cancer. I'm uh, the chair of uh, uh, Stratagem. It is uh, a project aiming at finding new markers and new drugs uh, for patients who do not respond to conventional therapies in cancer. Uh, now we have about uh, 300 scientists, including medical oncologists, pharmacologists, medicinal chemistry, uh, expert uh, in uh, toxicology, in bioinformatics, in um, artificial intelligence uh, from about 33 countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we um, start from a simple consideration. There are no algorithms that can predict if a patient will respond or not to uh, the treatment, to chemotherapy in particular. And there are no drugs effective against resistant uh, cancers. So we aim at identifying new biomarkers that can predict if a patient will respond or not to the therapy by using high throughput screening, data mining, and artificial intelligence. Synthesize new drugs also using nanomedicine-based drugs. Uh, and test the safety and the efficacy of this drug in biological samples that have the same cells of the patients, the directly derived from the tumor. So our goal is to create a personalized diagnosis and treatment for patients who do not respond to chemotherapy. The European B cost action is composed of experts from 21 European countries, um, all with the same aim of uh, improving treatment for a very rare abdominal cancer called pseudomyxoma peritonei, or PMP for short. PMP starts out as a tumor in the appendix, and then this tumor bursts and cells are seeded into the peritoneal cavity. And um, when it grows, it will increase the abdominal volume and compress the organs. Here we see on the left in uh, a 30 year old woman uh, with PMP, the large abdomen. And on the right, we see a CT scan where we can see this grayish areas around compressing the intestines and also the liver. If all this tumor can be removed by surgery, the patient may be cured. But for the ones who cannot be cured by surgery, we actually don't have any treatment that's, uh, that's effective. So therefore we need research, but research in rare cancers is very challenging, both to get funding, but also to have access to patients. And this is where European P can help by being a strong platform for um, collaboration across Europe for this disease. So thank you so much for um, presenting us the, the, the kind of activities that your organizations um, develop. Um, now we go to another question, the, 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 the first real question, which I think I believe is is highly, is highly relevant. A question that uh, we asked the members of, of this uh, 
uh, expert panel uh, and was also uh, recorded. Uh, the question is uh, as follows. The Mission Council report was delivered in September 2020. In your view, what is the biggest challenge uh, it describes and what needs to be considered in the future implementation? I believe we also have a video. Well, I'd like first to compliment uh, Professor Ricciardi and Professor Chamien and the whole group that worked on the cancer mission plan. Uh, this was uh, a very efficient way of working. They also called for other people to help them devise the plan called the cancer mission assembly. And uh, overall, this plan is very, very ambitious. Basically, it looks at three pillars about the uh, screening and uh, about the uh, avoidance of cancer altogether to treatment and diagnosis for the treatment and then quality of life of patients. The major issue, as far as I'm concerned about this, is that we have yet to come to the implementation of the superb ideas. And this implementation phase is going to be complex. I understand the mission has been working very closely with different directors of the European Union. And they also have been working in parallel with the beating cancer plan that is going to be announced on February 4th in its final version. All of this will need a fabulous coordination. And by heaven's sake, do not reinvent the wheel. A lot has been done. A lot of expertise is available. We just need to coordinate better. That's our opinion. Well, in my opinion, I believe that there are two big challenges interconnected. The first one is the need to, of integrating all the disciplines that are now involved in treating the cancer. Cancer is not only a medical or a biological uh, problem. From the first day you are diagnosed of cancer, you have a medical problem, psychological problem, sometimes problem with your family, with, with your everyday life, with your job and uh, career. So we need to grant uh, to each one the best access to the program of screening and early detection uh, to the less invasive and effective uh, treatment to rehabilitation, but also a psychological and juridic support. This will also change maybe the way of thinking of cancer that most people have. Most people uh, think that to have a diagnosis of cancer means have a diagnosis of death. This is not true. Cancer must become, thanks to this integrating ap approach, a disease that must, be, that must be treated, but that can accompany the people for a long time and with a good life, of, uh, with a good quality of life. The second point is the inequities that we experiment between the countries and also between different uh, zones of the same countries. So we must grant the, to each citizen the best access to the program of screening, diagnosis and treatment. And the same, we must grant the access to the best educational uh, program about the risk factors or uh, correct behavior. And as a scientist, we must work for sure to improve the diagnosis and the treatment, but also to provide clear uh, communication using different channels, different way, depending on the audience that we have in front of uh, uh, you, to reach everyone. And uh, so integrating all the discipline that are using to treat uh, cancer and overcoming the disparities are the two big challenge of the program. 
I think the Mission Cancer Report was an interesting document, and I think that the aims of the EU are quite ambitious but important. Of the four focus areas mentioned in this report, I think that for PMP in particular, the two most important challenges are um, to uh, improve diagnostics and treatment and uh, equitable access to treatment and, and di diagnostics. A key recommendation in the report is pan-European initiatives. Uh, this is a, an aspect that is particularly important in rare cancers uh, because for one thing, it will increase the number of patients available for studies, but this type of initiatives will also ensure that any progress that is made will be available to all European citizens. From our perspective, the most important thing that the mission board should keep in mind is that rare cancers actually represent more than a quarter of case, uh, cancer cases in total. So this means that we cannot really beat cancer if we don't also beat the rare cancers. To my mind, the biggest challenge is the implementation of uh, the so-called personalized medicine, which may bring the fine tuning that is now lacking for covering the uh, broad spectra of cancer types um, and the evolution within each uh, patient. However, this uh, cannot become a reality without a proper harmonization among all the, the relevant European actors in, in cancer by sharing, especially sharing the knowledge as it is being produced. So we need effective means to avoid the duplicity of research several places in Europe with a subsequent loss of funding and also resources. Uh, and finally, and this is very important to my mind at least, is that the Europe has to truly believe about cancer beating as a team and not sustaining a sort of a race of many countries to be the first in reaching uh, the finish line. Okay, so in capital letters, we must act as a team. Um, from our perspective, the first challenge is the prevention. Uh, so it's really good that that has a prominent place in the reports. Clearly, you know, diet, physical activity and other lifestyle factors play a huge role here. And we know that at least 13 types of cancer are linked to obesity. Uh, although it is so obvious and many people would agree that prevention is very important, the resources tend to go to research and development on treatment because there's an urgency there, which is understandable. You want to help the people who have cancer now. But in the end, I think that's taking a short term view. It's not financially tenable because the rising cost of cancer treatment is one of the big threats to our health systems. Um, you know, uh, to prevent is better than to cure, of course. And there's the added bonus that if we can better understand how to promote healthier lifestyles, that will address a whole range of disease. I do want to comment here also with a view to the implementation plan that we shouldn't focus too much on information and education of the public because it has been shown that by itself, that's not very effective. It's really much more about the food environment that we all live in. And the other big challenge in the report uh, that is very poorly researched so far is the quality of life of patients and survivors. Uh, diet and physical activity could be very supportive there, but we just don't know that much about it yet. So thank you. Uh, can I ask that uh, the speakers and uh, uh, members of the panel turn their cameras off? Because maybe before continuing to the next question, there are, I think, at this stage, a couple of burning questions that will be good to be uh, to be discussed. Um, so I believe also that uh, Daniel cannot be with us today, but we have uh, one member of the cost action on, um, on uh, magnetic hyperthermia for cancer therapy in Guyan C. Tan, who's going to also join us in the discussion. So please feel free to turn your cameras and your audios on. Thank you. Well, first comment slash question. I heard during your presentations words 
that I've been uh, listening to over the last few years, important words that are synonyms of one reality, coordination, integration, harmonization. Uh, Daniel says something very challenging, very graphic. We must act as a team. Um, I would like to that you share your thoughts with us on what are the key elements for creating this chemistry in a, in a landscape which has been tremendously fragmented over the last uh, few years. And uh, the challenge will be to make sure that the enormous energy produced by the European research area produces outcomes that are going to interconnect to each other to narrow the gap between research and the solutions. And maybe this, this first question goes to Professor Ricciardi, because I'm absolutely sure that this is one of the main uh, elements that the mission board have in their mind when they shape the development of the mission. Yeah, I think that uh, we must have a plan for this. Of course, we, I couldn't agree more with uh, the remarks and comments and suggestions that came from colleagues. Uh, but I think that to do that, we must have a plan. And also this plan has to be creative. Uh, somehow uh, for having uh, these uh, ambitious uh, uh, targets realized that uh, you must have also ambitious new way of financing, you know, so it's not the same and also new ways of evaluating. I can tell you that uh, the new uh, time plan of the board is very much focusing on this. So we are going to develop uh, a, an implementation plan with a general description of different sections. So the current, and, and of course, I, I couldn't agree more with, the, with Professor Upper. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, you know? So we want to take advantage of the incredible experience that has been already developed, but maybe we, are, we want to put them all together and we want to support the, the good uh, activities that have already taken place. So we are going to describe the current state, so how the situation currently is in a certain intervention area. We are going to describe the vision, so the ideal scenario at the formal end of the mission in 2027. We are drafting the specific objectives, so the steps to be taken through the missions to achieve the vision. We are going to outline the actions and the timeline, correlate directly to the work program that need to be developed along the years. We are going to take into consideration the transversal issues. So uh, the, the, the horizontal issues such as equality and access, uh, communication needs, citizen engagement, etc. We are going to describe the actors and the resources uh, uh, that could implement the actions and provide funding. Also with different tools, because of course the initiatives uh, comes from the G research and DG Sante, but there are other important uh, DGs that can play an important role. We're going to uh, describe the, the, the indicators, so how the impact of the actions uh, can and will be measured in a, in, a, in a different way. We are going to take uh, into account the ongoing initiative, so the projects uh, funded by the European Union or by others whose results can directly feed into the actions. Uh, we're going to um, take into account demonstrators, so small scale actions that can be used as scaling up evidence that an idea works and it can be implemented at European Union level. We are going to interact with member states, uh, if and how and which member states could contribute to the actions proposed. And we are going to focus on, uh, on this team building, so the, the international cooperation, if how the actions proposed can have an international component to achieve the mission's objective. Just to give an idea on some concrete steps, uh, each mission has been funded with five millions to prepare this plan. Uh, we, have already, we are already discussing how to use these five million. So for instance, we are going to launch a coordinated and support actions on the preparing UNCAN.U. So the European Initiative to Understand Cancer will be based on a call on coordinating and support actions, which uh, the expected outcome is the, the, the fact that based on agreed strategic research and innovation agenda, academic and clinical research centers, innovators, member state, states and associated countries can play uh, in preparing these future fully fledged uncan.eu initiatives that could underpin all future mission on cancer priorities. So that, this is just to give you an idea. Other actions, uh, other procurement actions that we want to launch uh, are in the field of prevention. So we want to have a SWOT analysis on cancer registries and cancer 
registration in EU27 and associated countries. A SWOT study on population risk-based screening and early detections of different kinds of uh, screenings in, in EU27 and associated countries. And a SWOT study on the commercial determinants of health, uh, a study on cancer health literacy in EU27 and associated countries. We want to base our implementation plan on the study on comprehensive cancer cancer infrastructures in EU27 and on the interest feasibility of a pragmatic co-funded clinical trial program. I mean, this just to give you an idea, and this is going to be outlined in the, in the next months, hopefully will be public uh, in, in May. Thank you, Professor Ricciardi. Uh, Dr. Bregantina, Professor Ricciardi mentioned something very important, which I think the relationship between the mission and the activities, policies, and the strategies of the member states. In a, in a world where sometimes there has not been a real strong alignment between the policies of the Commission and the needs and perspectives of the member states, what, what, what's your vision about how this is going to work in the future for the development of the cancer mission? Are we going to be a real team? Yes, thank you. I was thinking to myself, uh, what would be the key word? And I think the buzzword would be trust. And trust must be earned. And you earn it every day, day by day, by the way how you work. It's true for the patients and it's true in the member states. So it must be trust in knowledge and science. So if we all work together in research, if we follow the good practices in research, if we exchange our practices, if we know how you do your research and how I do mine, uh, then we can exchange this, so we can trust each other. Uh, then there is uh, trust and transparency in funding. I think it's also very important. Um, and then there is, of course, the shared values and ethics. And if this all goes together, then you earn the trust and then you can work as a team. You cannot work as a team if there is no trust. So I think this is, this is the basics of every cooperation. And I think in Europe, we are actually lucky to share the same values. Um, we share the same lifestyles, so very much across the Europe, uh, but there are some differences and there are some uh, inequalities which have to be addressed, especially when they affect the quality of life. So I think that if we really see each other um, as a trustworthy partners, then we can work together. And with COVID-19, we have seen good practices and excellent collaboration, but we have also seen the practices we don't want to repeat. So I think we can learn from both bad and the good practices and then carry on with good practices. Thank you, Tina. Uh, Professor Apromati, uh, you have, we have here key representatives of the scientific community in the cancer field that work in quite different issues. Prevention, small cancers, nanomedicines, uh, drug discovery. How, what should be the role of the patient community uh, in trying to support the, the process of interconnecting these uh, apparently different scientific communities. Well, thank you for asking me to speak on behalf of the patients of the 20 patient organizations in the European Cancer Organization. We have, uh, of course, been discussing about uh, all of these issues in the last few months. And what is absolutely crystal clear is that throughout Europe, there is big hope in the patient community that uh, all these uh, ideas that have been put forward, which uh, are very well uh, designed now, but need to be executed in a correct way, uh, will, will be supported. But it was already said by a couple of people uh, today, a, a very important point is the communication of what is being done, where do we stand now, what is our goal? And this was very nicely said by Walter Ricciardi. He's going with his group to show what is the goal to 2027 and some ideas of how to go forward. And we need to put this in and we need to involve the patients 
because sometimes what we believe as professionals, as I am, as many of you are, might not be exactly what the patients have as a priority. And we have to have a way to call upon them. And we are here to help with all our 20 patient organizations, which represent, I believe, uh, most of the European organizations, but of course, in every country, we have excellent organizations. Certainly, I'm pretty sure that my colleagues from the different scientific actions uh, uh, acknowledge and recognize the important, inspiring role of the, of the patient advocacy groups when they develop their activities. I have questions for you, members of the cost actions, but I'm going to uh, save these questions for the, for the slot that we're going to have after the next video, okay? So um, we, like in the other previous two videos, we asked uh, the members of this panel how they can contribute to beating cancer. Uh, how do they see the role in the future implementation plan? So let's see the video. I think that the, my main contribution to, to beat cancer may come from the application of nanotechnology to cancer diagnosis and, and treatment, which is an area that could be designated as a nano theranostics. And what we look forward is to concomitantly track the action of, of a therapy as it, it is being applied uh, or administered to, to a patient. This is possible by bringing together uh, advanced treatment and molecular imaging methods based on both on nanotechnology. For example, uh, an application could be the, the combination, is actually the combination of magnetic hypothermia that I explained briefly before, and a new diagnostic technique that is called magnetic particle imaging. As I, um, as I mentioned before, in magnetic hypothermia, we're treating tumors using a localized heat that comes from exposing tiny magnetic nanoparticles to external magnetic fields. This heat can either directly harm tumor cells or at least can sensitize them to the first line treatments like chemo or radiotherapy. Used this, using this in combination with magnetic particle imaging, and this is the important and, and very novel thing that uh, we bring. We can check the fate of these nanoparticles that we're putting inside uh, the body of the patients in real time. And we can actually monitor the progression of the treatment. So back to the rare cancers. These cancers have taught us a lot about cancer in general. And I think there is a hugely underexploited potential in rare cancer research. For instance, in PMP, we have identified a specific gene mutation that is very common in PMP, but it is also present in a lot of other cancers in subgroups of more common cancers. This means that when we develop treatment for directed at this mutation, we also not only develop treatment for PMP, but for also for other cancers. So it will have a, a much broader impact than for the, for the rare cancer. I think the role of European P in this context will be to continue to communicate the importance of rare cancers in Europe. Of course, our main focus is on PMP and on completing the goals of our action. But I also think that the challenges that we face is very similar to the challenges that any rare cancer researcher will face. So this means that if we develop good strategies for managing PMP and developing this type of research, we will in the, in the end also improve our chances of actually beating cancer by 2030. The European Cancer Organization, which, as I said, comprises 34 professional organizations and 20 patient organizations, has been in constant dialogue with, uh, of course, Commissioner Stella Kyriakidis and the various directorates that are going to be working specifically on these plans and developing the various calls and the various ways to go ahead with these plans. What we can do is that in one single address, 
the various directorates can find a group of experts that can reply to a question without having to address this to various people. We can coordinate, we can help in this way. And this is what we have been doing, helping to development of the beating cancer plan uh, in close cooperation and many other societies, of course, uh, with the uh, DG Santé. Well, I believe that uh, a stratagem can contribute at least in three ways. First, we are uh, studying new drugs effective against resistant uh, cancer. And uh, we hope that at the end of the project in 2022, uh, some of them reach phase one or phase two clinical uh, trial. Uh, second, we are building a sort of fingerprint or identity card, let's say, of each patient that can predict if that patient will respond or not to the treatment in order to avoid unnecessary treatment and address the patient to the best treatment for her or him. And third, we are implementing the network between academic and research institution, small and medium enterprise and pharma companies located in European countries. Because we believe that uh, Europe must be as much as possible autonomous in producing and delivery drug. This is a lesson that unfortunately we learn from the ongoing pandemics where maybe for, um, the, for the first time in the history, most countries experimented the problem of a shortage of uh, drugs, medical disposal, vaccines. This must not occur for anti-cancer drug. So our goal, maybe our ambitious goal, is to create a hub where both academic institutions and companies can cover the full process from the design of a drug to the marketing and to the delivery of the drug to each citizen in each European country. Mm -hmm. These are our contribution to beating cancer. Um, as I mentioned, I think we have, uh, I think a lot of the work that we are already doing and that we are also planning to do in terms of prevention, so behavior policies uh, is equally relevant for the prevention of cancer. And at the moment we are developing our implementation plan 2020, uh, 2022 <laughs> to 2024. Uh, and there are also some research topics actually in there specifically related to cancer that we're being, uh, that we're discussing at the moment for example, on nutritional guidance for cancer patients and survivors. So that, that's very relevant. I think our current work should feed into the research agenda and implementation plan of the mission on cancer. Uh, we definitely need to explore how we can connect also our future activities to what's being done around the mission. And um, I think researchers from our community are really well placed to give input on research topics that um, might not be within our scope in the upcoming years, but are very important in relation to the mission. So, for example, on how nutrition can lower risks for people with an increased um, genetic risk of certain cancers, because um, as with the other uh, topics, we just don't know a lot about that yet. So thank you. Please turn your cameras on. Uh, yeah, it's been great and very, I think it's very inspiring to see how the scientific community really can contribute if we find the best way for creating this team and working uh, as a team. Uh, Chrissy, I have a question for you because you've been claiming the importance of prevention from the very, very beginning. I remember that when we met in Brussels uh, last year, you were already trying to, to, to be very uh, strongly opinionated about this point. So the mission is going to be organized based on these three pillars, prevention, diagnostic and treatment and quality of life. How can we interconnect these communities? Because the professionals that work in the prevention field, they tend to be very different from the professionals that work in the, in the development of drugs or quality of life. What's your perspective? Yeah, um, that, that's that's interesting, of course. I, I think in the field of nutrition, it's something um, 
that's maybe a, a bit more common already than in the field of cancer research, uh, but also they're, they're, they're quite separate worlds. But of course, in an initiative like the JPI, um, we work both on very basic research, but also on the more applied research, sort of really trying to address the societal issues and making that translation from the basic research into societal impact. Um, and um, as has been mentioned before, it's really about how you organize the coordination because it's not up to the researchers to organize this. I mean, you can have all sorts of like um, workplaces and hubs where you bring researchers together, but they do research fundamentally different things. So it's about the people who are coordinating these initiatives to have a good plan for this and, um, and to carry this out. And sort of coordinators, knowledge brokers, people who really look at, at implementation and impact. Um, and I think you should really look at it in, in that way. I think it's in this element of coordination, there is something, uh, uh, Hersti mentioned something very interesting uh, because she said something, what I think is, is something that for the development of the mission, we have to keep in mind, the knowledge that uh, the research in, in, in rare cancer generates can be, uh, is essential uh, and can be really translated for finding solutions when you are dealing with common cancers. So, uh, but again, the community that works in rare cancers tends to be a little bit different from the one that works in common cancers. What are your thoughts about this uh, apparent dichotomy, Kirsty? Well, um, I think it's, uh, I think it's, um, uh, I agree that there are some, some differences, but I, I think the one of the main challenges of working with a rare cancer is that the research groups uh, or the research, the research activity is very fragmented. It's very difficult to, to develop uh, good sustainable teams that can work over time because, because partly the funding situation is difficult, but also getting uh, um, uh, connected to, to people who, are, who have the same interests is, uh, is a challenge, which is something we see in our action, but I, I, I know that this is the case in many rare cancers. So it's difficult to really uh, harness that possible advantage to that many of these teams uh, actually have developed already. So Chiara and Tan, you represent cost actions uh, uh, where the scientific community they're really trying to, to develop new approaches for the treatment of cancer. Uh, what would you ask the policymakers? What, what's your, let's say, what, what, you have policymakers here. Tina is, is I think, is smiling because he, <laughs> he uh, acknowledges that he's one of the recipients of this question. But what would you ask the policymakers for making sure that the knowledge that you generate at the end is going to be transformed into a solution for the cancer patient community? Um, okay, so um, obviously the very uh, common route is uh, publication and dissemination. So we have done really well with our cost action because our website has been ongoing and live. Um, and so recently we have a publication that we're using the synergetic effect of not only a magnetic hypothermia cancer treatment, as Daniel Ortega mentioned on his talk, but we also combine with existing modality of therapy, such as the chemotherapy and finding the synergetic effect and um, journalists pick it up and uh, running it into the mainstream media, uh, for example, in the Daily Mail. So uh, yes, yeah, so we, we have uh, to actively um, engage uh, with the community um, so so that I think one of the things that we need to get approval. Um, approval from the public is very important because the funds are coming from the public so we need to get approval from public for doing our research but also the acceptance of the new technology such as uh, the new one that we are developing that like magnetic hypothermia cancer treatment. So um, I think there is a will, there is a, a way. So if you can see that how vaccine have been developed for COVID is super fast and why the cancer were taking so long. And it's just like, you see that there is a drive. And so uh, I just feel that in, in the cancer field, there would be more uh, coordination and it's, it's more willing 
and you know, like the regulatory process uh, will be will be shorter, and if people public will be more receptive to accept. Uh, so let's say you know people go on clinical trial vaccine because people think that's going to help. So we need a lot more engagement um, with the public, and also another thing is that uh, as, as uh, somebody already said that we need to work at the team. Um, so it's a whole change uh, we need to, to go through. Is that research in the lab, regulatory uh, patient group, um, and also commercialization. So it needs to be taken up by the pharma uh, and also uh, manufacturing. Uh, how are you going to produce some things? So it's a whole chain system. So when you're going to uh, create, uh, I hope, you know, like another cost action coming um, in for this type of research but we need to engage um, a lot of more actor. That's not only research uh, or clinician, um, but the whole range, um, different sector in the economy and also policy maker as well, yes. Thank you. So Chiara, as a scientist, what's your, what's your request to the policy makers on, on you know, the people that at the end of the day are going to shape the pathway for the mission to progress? Yes. Uh, well, I agree with uh, Tan uh, because uh, I believe that the key uh, of translating the research into an effective uh, uh, thing is uh, the transdisciplinarity, uh, having board with different stakeholder where basic research scientists, clinical oncologists, uh, patients advocacy, policy maker can speak each uh, other is uh, the key point. Otherwise, uh, we can make uh, the better research, but uh, then we have a lot of difficulties because uh, each country have the different uh, law in approving uh, the treatment uh, or uh, the diagnosis uh, um, practices. Uh, we have different, we have uh, to deal with different institution, regulatory uh, agency, and so on. So I believe that a program with uh, the perspective of beating cancer has the possibility really to make a different world to speak together. And uh, by starting speaking and uh, starting to uh, pointing out the main uh, um, criticism for scientists, clinicians, policy uh, makers, economists, maybe we can really contribute from the laboratory to the patients. So thank you. So Mati and Tina, you've been discussing in the chat something very important and very relevant, which is the issue of the inequities uh, that still exist and will probably remain in several European countries and how we can make sure that the, that the public is fully engaged into the development of this dream that we call the cancer mission. What are according to you the, the key elements to, to tackle the element of inequities and proper organizations between the, uh, uh, the, the healthcare systems at the national level and how to interconnect them uh, with a cancer mission well, if we have another hour to discuss, <laughs> I'll be happy to answer. Uh, but in, in a short answer, just coming to what Chiara said, if we all talk to each other, it will be so much easier. And this is one of the remits of the European Cancer Organization. We have what we call the focus topic networks that will bring together all those interests in a particular area so that they can talk to each other and not kind of everyone doing extremely well but not realizing what is being done anywhere. But closing this parenthesis, education is certainly one of the ways forward. Good, high quality communication. Unfortunately, as you all know, today we have a dramatic situation of misinformation, of partial information, which is diffused by all kinds of uncontrolled media. And we have to learn how to communicate better so that the citizens realize what can be done, what they should also do for themselves and are not influenced 
by those that are giving all kinds of wrong messages. This is the short answer to a very, very important question that I, I believe we'll hear more from Tina if Tina is still with us. Mati, can I ask you, can I ask you before we move to Tina, you think that the, uh, the, the, the patient community, the cancer patient community uh, at, at the, at the translational level in Europe is fully aware of the development of the cancer, of th that there is something on the table that is called the cancer mission that expresses the willingness of the policymakers to, to really change uh, people's life in the future? At the European level, I have no doubt because uh, I believe all important patient organizations are, are members of the European Cancer Organization and they work together in different ways. But uh, what we still need is a translation of all of this into the different countries. There's a huge effort uh, that uh, the cancer mission team has developed in the past few months of communicating. Walter said this to the citizens on what is go going on and what is being done. But it, it's very variable country per country. And also the influence of uh, the uh, cancer patient organization in different countries is extremely different. Some of them are very strong, others are not that strong. So there's a lot to be done, but there's also a huge, a, a fabulous amount of volunteers that are doing a fabulous job. And once again, putting them together will help a lot. The big problem in Europe is that Europe is wonderful because of all different cultures, but that means all different languages. And it's not easy to translate everything in every single language very quickly. Okay, Tina, anything to add? Yes, actually, I completely agree with uh, Mati and also with Chiara. Uh, I see it um, as a layer where the basis is really, we should all engage in joint research in EU. So the research should be joint. I, I mean, if we join our efforts together, we can do so much more. Uh, and then this level of researchers and scientists then they, sh they should talk to the second level of clinicians and nurses who are completely overworked and underpaid, I think, all over the Europe. Uh, and then this, this level should actually talk to patients and to populations, also using the NGOs. And it's really difficult to communicate science and and implement health literacy in the population because the researchers, they live in their own world. The clinicians and nurses, the medical people, they, they live in their own world, li like in their own bubble. And then, then you have the population, people, patients, they live in another. And then you have the policymakers. Actually, the policymakers should take care of all three layers and bringing them together so that they talk to each other so that we all actually benefit from this. But this is really not easy because it's completely different way of thinking, different way of acting. Uh, but I think this is actually the beauty what uh, Mati said, that we are different, but we share the same foundation, the same values. And, and this is where we can build the building together, right? So everybody bringing his own piece and all pieces together, they really make the building which we can all live in. And I think this is what the policymakers should see. They, they should see the whole building, not just particular interests. And I think it's really easy if somebody enters the politics after, after encountering all those layers um, because I think it's important to understand science. It's important to understand researchers and the clinicians. It's actually, sometimes it's easier to be the patient, right? Uh, so, and everybody on one point if he, in his life, we are going to be patients. I, I mean, it's inevitable, right? Yeah. Um, but I think this personal uh, involvement, it's, you, you should like go through all the transition phases. Uh, and as the policymaker, I think it's your duty uh, to know how to implement all those together and bring them together. But this is not easy. Thank you, Tina. Well, uh, 
Christy, very briefly, because we have to move to Q&A. To Q &A. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that because, of course, it starts with an awareness of how important it is that we should collaborate, that we should have transdisciplinarity, that we should do things jointly. But then you really have to look at the governance of RNI, the governance, the funding, which systemic barriers are there, because um, there's a lot of barriers in the system that prevent transdisciplinarity. Um, and so you already have to come together with all the different stakeholders and have a really open conversation about where do we want to be, where are we now, and what are the barriers that are stopping us from getting there. And sort of also these, these things like regulations and try to address that in the system together before you could really get to effective uh, collaboration with real impact. Thank you very as, much. As a note uh, to the policymakers. Yeah, yeah, good. So we have a few, we are running out of time, but we have a few uh, questions for the audience. And, and I'm trying to combine some of them because I think there are some of them that can be combined. Uh, there are some questions uh, specifically from Professor Ricciardi. Uh, Eddie asks, uh, if I understand correctly, the mission cancer will run until 2027. Will the current board shape all the core topics for this for this period? What will happen after 2021 with the mandate of the board ends? Will uh, will a new expert group be established? And also, uh, some uh, people attending the meeting uh, says, if a new cancer mission board is established from July onwards, how will the new board be constituted? Will regional and local authorities be closer associated? Uh, I, I am not able to answer this, uh, these uh, questions because it's work in progress. Uh, we can work uh, and our mandate has been extended up to July 21, uh, but you know, it's work in progress. So I'm not able to reply to this at this moment. What I know is that the commission has appointed uh, a, a, an officer for each mission to manage this. So each mission will have a specific officer to do that. Uh, and we will work, of course, with the, with the commission to, 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 to work on this, but uh, I, I'm not able to answer this moment. Thank you. There is also another question coming from the European Cancer Organization, and it's something that we've been kind of, it's been floating during the discussion. And the question says, I would like to ask the panel for their views on how to best ensure the cancer mission uh, and Europe beating cancer planner intimately link and working together setting common goals, performing common measurements of impact and progress. Uh, anyway, so please so, so or comments on that. Yes, uh, in, during this uh, year, we have been working in strict contact with the colleagues of DG Sante, you know, so they are fully aware of the work because they participated in each of our uh, meetings and uh, uh, they are going to take into full consideration of the work. I cannot reply because essentially I, of course, have a version, but it's not the, the version that is going to be released on uh, early February. Uh, but I'm fully confident that we will not be overlapping. Uh, so that after the publication of the European Building Cancer Plan in the Mission Board, we will be able maybe to focus uh, uh, funds uh, and uh, activities in something which is more related to research and innovation and European building cancer plans on, on policies and actions. Great. There is a very interesting question, and this goes to the uh, representatives of the cost actions. Sergi makes a very interesting comment. He says, cost actions are endeavors that have a huge potential to contribute in cancer mission. Uh, we had some contact with other cost actions, but some more effort should be put on increasing interaction between them for mutual benefits. Any thoughts about this? Please be brave. Yes. Um, I, oh, please, uh, please share. See. Yeah, well, I, I can uh, only speak from the experience of the, the um, gathering of cost actions uh, in um, in Brussels, where uh, at least uh, we uh, heard of this for the first time, uh, and I, I thought it was very interesting and very fruitful to discuss with many other cost actions working with cancer. So, uh, so I think this is a good point. I fully agree. Uh, cost uh, association uh, offer us the possibility to interact. Uh, with uh, uh, cost uh, um, 
action working on the same similar topic. So it's a tremendous tool that we have in our hands to implement the collaboration between uh, complementary non-overlapping field that move in the same direction. Chrissy yeah. or, or Tan, any thoughts about yes, that? Yes, um, I totally agree with that because I'm participated in two court action. One is a radio max, um, which finished, and also another one with uh, microwave. So it's a different modality of the treatment, but at the end, we are dealing with the same thing that killing the cancer. So there is a lot of um, complementary um, expertise or uh, things that we can can think about. So yes, so so connection between the different costs is is a wonderful thing. Yes. So great. Uh, I think it's very important uh, and has been mentioned before that we already have uh, powerful tools in Europe like cost actions or, for instance, research infrastructures that are structures that uh, have the expertise to interconnect the different communities and this element of interconnection. Is, uh, is obviously the, the, going to be the key role for the development of the action. Before wrapping up, uh, I would like to that you give us a short take home message. Mati, you're the first. Believe in cooperation. This is the way to win. Great. Tina. Yes, I think that the burden of disease can be alleviated. If everyone takes his own burden, then together we can lift a very heavy burden of disease such as is the cancer. So together we can manage. Chrissy. Birds data really have a good balance between basic and applied science and to make sure that prevention in terms of lifestyle, so not just uh, screening is really invested in. Um, well, it would be not to forget the rare cancers because they hold the key to solving many of the important questions. Thank you. Chiara? Uh, building a, a multi-layer platform where every uh, actor and uh, researcher policy maker can uh, really work together, trust each other. Done. Collaboration, collaboration and collaboration in all different level and different, different um, aspect, um, you know, in, with a different actor, different sector. So it's again, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Thank you. And uh, last but not the least, and as a chair of the board, what's your take on message, Professor Ricciardi? Uh, conquering cancer is mission possible, but only in Europe at the moment. Great. <laughs> so I think that we all agree that the title of this webinar, Beating Cancer by 2030, Mission Impossible, maybe the question mark, we can start diluting it, right? Okay, so thank you so much for not only for uh, being members of this uh, group, but also for your commitment, for your enthusiasm, and for your, uh, for your vision on, uh, on how to tackle this challenge. Thank you also so much to the Costa Association for organizing this webinar, and in particular to Mafalda Quintas and Federica Ortelli that have been behind the scenes moving every single piece. It's been terrific having you on board. I'm pretty sure that this is the first step of a long pathway, and I hope that we will have uh, more opportunities to to keep discussing on how to uh, facilitate the progress of the cancer mission, hopefully as on the stage, face to face. So thank you so much and please stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.